Fire and Ice, 1983 explored. How the greatest sword and sorcery film flopped, only to become a cult classic later. Disney created and released a lot of animated movies in the 70s, but by the 80s they became more focused on live action films. Naturally, there was a demand and supply gap in the market for animated films. This was the time when several different production houses came forward to provide an alternative to Disney's sweet musicals. While many made films as sugary sweet as Disney, the others figured out that animated films did not have to be just for children. In every list of such revolutionaries, the name Ralph Bakshi and Frank Frazetta do seem to appear. While Bakshi was the man behind the pieces of art such as Fritz the Cat and Wizards, Frazetta is known for his cover photos of several Conan the Barbarian comics. The two of them co-produced a rotoscopic masterpiece in 1983 named Fire and Ice. Although it tanked at the box office, it later became a cult classic, something that fans have been craving for ever since. Now, before we go into our explanation, let me brief you about what rotoscoping is. It's basically a movie-making style where actors are filmed on a sound stage, and then the resulting film is hand-drawn frame by frame as reference points for the animators. Although a tedious and dexterous process, the results are thrilling. In this video, we will explore the 1983 film with sorcerers, giant lizards, brave warriors, and an enticing princess before detailing why the film deserves more than it receives. Let's begin, shall we? Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a whole lot. So thank you, and let's begin. The End of Mankind as We Know It Fire and Ice, 1983 The film starts with an old lady's shivering voice explaining the premise of the magnificent story we are about to learn. Fire and Ice is set around the end of the glacial period, which is more commonly known as the end of the last ice age. For those of you wondering how long ago this actually was, well, it was about 10,000 years ago from today. As we all know from the Ice Age franchise, the world was left transformed in more ways than just one because country-sized glaciers had melted away. However, apart from the flora, fauna, and the geography, there was something else that was changing. An evil queen by the name of Juliana ruled over the north, possibly the ice-capped lands. But Juliana's ambitions were to extend her empire far beyond the glaciers, and she wanted to rule the world. But one woman alone could not possibly achieve such objectives. For this purpose, she bore a son and named him Necron. Well, I know, that's not a very unique name, but it does project the image that Juliana wanted. I mean, if we consider the DC villain Necron, he was the very personification of death and ruled over a place called Land of the Unliving. And that definitely says something about the guy. Nevertheless, our Necron was an equally evil dude who aced in the art of sorcery and can control the minds of others. In fact, Juliana made sure that her son learned these powers and mastered them so that she could further move ahead to fulfill her plan of global reign. As Necron grew older and stronger, he unleashed his icy wrath upon mankind. Not only would he engulf lands with massive glaciers, he would send his army of subhuman monstrosities to kill and capture whoever remained. The remnants of humanity started to move south towards the equator, to the land of the Fire People who were ruled by the King Geral, who lived in a volcanic citadel called Firekeep. Interestingly enough, the stuntmen who were playing Necron subhumans had an extremely troubled time working with Frank Frazetta, the man behind the muscular image of Conan the Barbarian. He would give insanely specific instructions on how to move, etc., most of which were incredibly hard to follow. Eventually, Necron and Juliana took over the last village in the north, and now only the Great Plain separated them from the Fire Keep, but it was a huge stretch of land. So Juliana came up with a sinister plan. She sent an emissary to Jeral in the Fire Keep with an offer of peace in return for total and unconditional surrender well aware of the fact that Geral would never agree to those terms. However, Juliana's real intention was to abduct Princess Tigra so that she could be presented as a bride to Necron. This would have formed a marriage alliance and strengthened Necron's claim over the world. 
Interestingly enough, Juliana was smart enough to play this move because if history has taught us one thing, it is the best form of an alliance is born out of marriage. Anyway, the plan succeeds and the subhumans manage to get Tigra. Speaking of Tigra, she has a fairly voluptuous figure. So much so that the creators were actually having a hard time finding someone to play the character. Ultimately, they settled for Cynthia Leek, who did a fairly good job. The film got a PG rating, but looking back at the things that she does in the film and the way that she did them, it's difficult to imagine how the film was suited for anyone under the age of 14. I mean, to escape the subhumans, she uses her nuclear hot figure to entice them. Although it is an animated film, it's kind of hard not to feel like a pervert whenever Princess Tigra is kind enough to grace herself on the screen. It is also important to note that Tigra was initially portrayed as a damsel in distress, but the way that she uses her body and mind to evade her captors proves that she is far from the typical cartoon heroine who needs to be saved all the time. She even kills several of the wildly powerful subhumans over the course of the film. After escaping from the subhumans for the first time, Tigra wanders the plains in search for food and shelter. She comes across Larn a young warrior who was sleeping beside a boar he had previously killed for food. She attempted to steal a piece of the boar, but Larn woke up and was immediately enticed by her beauty. Previously, Larn was introduced as a skilled young warrior who was the only survivor of a village that fell prey to Necron's glaciers and his subhuman army. Larn did all that he could to survive and killed several subhumans. In these few scenes where Larn fights his enemies, we get to see that the director Bakshi does not shy away from showing a bit of bloodshed. Clearly, this film was not made for children. Larn and Tigra meet each other only after 30 minutes of the film's runtime, but the two of them quickly develop feelings for each other. It's a bit sad that they do not share a screen time of more than 7 minutes during the entirety of the film. Nevertheless, after spending a few happy moments together, the two of them separate once again when Larn falls into the water and gets attacked by a gigantic Lovecraftian monster with huge tentacles. While Tigra manages to reach the shore, Larn gets thrown to the far side of the water. It's not before long that Tigra once again gets captured by the subhuman idiots. But Tigra's spirit is unbroken. She was someone who would go to any length to save herself, and so she did again. When the subhumans got wasted after drinking some alcohol, Tigra attempted to escape, but she had been chained to one of the uncivilized men so that she couldn't get away again. However, she kills him and drags him along, only to fall from a small cliff. Meanwhile, Larn had joined hands with a mysterious man named Dark Wolf. The interesting thing about this character was that he was never named in the film, and his backstory was cut out to shorten the film's length. However, it was revealed that Dark Wolf shared some serious beef with Juliana, probably because she destroyed his entire village along with his family. Larn and Dark Wolf come to rescue Tigra, but they could not find her. On the other hand, Tigra seemingly gets saved by a giant named Atwa, who is the son of a witch named Rolil. The giant breaks Tigra's chains and brings her to his mother, who ultimately drugs her and asks her son to call the subhumans so that she could offer Tigra to Necron in exchange for earning a few favors from the icy overlord. However, the subhumans simply murder the weird mother-son duo. Honestly speaking, this subplot could have been just eliminated because it really served no purpose. Alternatively, Bakshi could have expanded a little on Rolil's story and role because she honestly seemed like a promising character. The subhumans finally take Tigra to Ice Peak, the citadel of Necron and Juliana, where Juliana introduces Tigra to Necron as his bride and mother to the heir. However, Necron does not want her because he thinks that other humans are low creatures, or at least not as great as he is. At this point, we should probably be calling the guy Necron the Nazi. Although he refuses to marry her, naturally, he does keep her as a hostage. Meanwhile, Larn continues his search for Tigra and comes across the remains of Witch Rolil. Well, the enemy of an enemy is a friend, and the undead Rolil tells Larn about the way to Ice Peak and how to find Tigra. Larn continues his journey and travels to Ice Peak as a stowaway on the ship of Prince Taro, the son of Jeral. So Jeral had sent his son with peace terms because Tigra had been missing for quite a while now. With no other solution in sight for the release of his beloved daughter, Jeral agreed to accept Necron as the Overlord. 
but Necron makes Prince Taro kill himself and the other members of his emissary. On the other hand, Lauren reaches the frozen fortress after a lot of trouble, but does not succeed in saving his lady love. Fortunately for him, Dark Wolf reaches just in time to save Lauren from imminent death. In the end, the two realize that to fight a king, they need a king by their side and decide to go to King Jeral to seek help. Jeral's daughter was missing and his son had been killed, so he offered Larn and Darkwolf all the help he could and supplied the warrior companions with dragonhawks or dinosaur-like creatures. They used the dragonhawks to fly to Ice Peak, where Darkwolf came face to face with Necron. Meanwhile, Larn manages to rescue Tigra from the clutches of Juliana. Back at the fortress, Darkwolf and Necron get into a high-octane battle. Necron's sorcery and mind control seemed rather futile against the strong will and fighting skills of Darkwolf, who was determined to get his revenge. In the end, he manages to slay Necron, but the icy overlord's agony was such that it created massive waves of glaciers all across the land and reached the borders of Jeral's kingdom. Naturally, he opened the lava gates and flooded the lands with lava to stop the glaciers from reaching Firekeep. However, the lava obliterated everything in its way, including Juliana and the subhuman army. Larn and Tigra ended up together and may have led a happy life. As for Larn, he could very well have become the heir to Jeral's kingdom. Having achieved his objective, Dark Wolf once again disappeared. How Ralph Bakshi and Frank Frazetta created a rotoscopic masterpiece. While Frazetta's imagination was brought to life by Bakshi in the director's chair, Roy Thomas and Jerry Conway were responsible for writing the film, both of whom had served as editors-in-chief at Marvel Comics. On the other hand, James Gurney and Thomas Kincaid served as background artists, while Gurney later became the mind behind Dinotopia. Kincaid came to be known as the painter of light for his amazing understanding of the subject. These two artists used to share a room as freshmen at the University of California and then studied at the Art Center College of Design in California. So, you see, all these men were masters in their respective fields, and when they create something, it is bound to be a class apart. It is a different thing that the film tanked when it released. While Frazetta may seem like someone who can get difficult to work with at times, artist James Gurney revealed in his blogs that he brought a lot of inspiration to the team, especially the background painters, layout people, and the animators. All the paintings were done in 9 by 12 inches using cell vinyl acrylics, while the first shot of Necron's castle was done in an 11 by 14. But Bakshi was another force of positivity on the sets, and he often looked after the staging and whatnot apart from dispersing his directorial duties. In the end, it can be said without an ounce of doubt that it all came together to make a film that became a cult classic, something that people crave even today. I mean, those who have even a little knowledge of rotoscoping would know that it is an extremely time-consuming process, but the results it provides are totally worth it. This is why the movements of the subhumans, Tigra's enticing body, and the action sequences felt so realistic. How the greatest rotoscopic animated flopped because of one big reason. Now that we have established that the film was a masterpiece in its own right, it is important to talk about why the film failed at the box office. I mean, the film was so short-lived that Gurney could not even watch it in the theaters because he was on a short foreign tour. One possible reason could be that despite being a film with a simple and child-friendly story, the characters and their attire are not that way. Most of the characters seem to have mastered the art of loincloths, but that's not entirely what was required in the film. On the other hand, Bakshi and Frazetta aimed for a PG rating, and on the other, they made Tigra look like a complete bombshell, and oftentimes she was drawn semi-nude. Now, if it's children you want to please, you have to ensure that the parents think the film is suited for their children, which was probably far from true. And, if you want a heroine who could serve as a model for the cover of Picture of Playboy, then you should have made a film for older audiences. But... What else could be expected out of someone who is celebrated for painting Conan the Barbarian and other classic covers for the Mastro named Robert E. Howard? 
Speaking of Conan and Howard, you should check out our video titled 10 Epic Lesser Known Facts About Conan the Barbarian, the true alpha of Hyborian universe. We'll leave the link in the description. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. So have a good one and be safe. Thanks, everybody.